Check this out. That's a little misting station here. I'm mostly growing things in the ground, but I have some citrus trees and stuff. And this is also like a kind of a, have you seen my water feature? <laughs> it's like a nice way if it gets too hot, just give myself a little something something. Uh, so today I've been really contemplating a lot of new things. I just went to the farmer's market, biked out there. I think living out in Denver has gotten me so much more connected to just being in nature. And I'm spending like four or five hours a day right now working in my garden. And it's turning more into a food forest. So I'm growing maybe a hundred different things. I'm growing, of course, standard vegetables and stuff like that, but also a lot of things that are unique, different types of berries and fruits and stuff that might be in some cases more exotic, in some cases more local to here. And what I've been discovering is the more I get in touch with, you know, ingredients that are in season that are growing fresh, um, the less interested I am in making food that's super complex and kind of out there and exotic and wild. And it might not be as, you know, virally this and that. And I don't really care about that anymore because what I care about is helping inspire you feel more connected to the actual food that is surrounded by you so this isn't about looking at what I'm growing and trying to grow that or trying to get access to that it's just kind of opening your mind up to understanding that like when you go to a farmers market for example you're gonna be getting the freshest and most in-season stuff so oftentimes it might even be more affordable because it's what the farmers have right on hand and they're you know they're starting to sell and get rid of um, so when you get more connected to how ingredients grow and using them in really creative and simple ways you know, your mind opens up to this whole new world. <sighs> so I'm working on this series right now where I try to figure out the 10 most versatile ingredients in the world. And I'm not just talking, you know, like your favorite ingredients, but what ingredients if you were stranded on a desert island and you only had 10 ingredients to survive off of, what would be the most versatile ingredients in terms of flavors, textures, taste, nutrients, creativity and all that stuff. So people send in a lot of great suggestions. I'm still working on my sort of 10. Um, but the main inspiration and the main focus and intention of this series is to really help you understand ingredients in a much more simple way. Today I'm gonna to be working with a couple of my favorite ingredients and also showing you guys a couple of cool things that you can do. So I've got some cabbage here. Cabbage is of course amazing. It's really cheap. One for um, uh, cabbage is really cheap. Um, there's you know green, purple, savoy, napa. There's all types. This is like a savoy cabbage. Um, used a lot in Korean cuisines and stuff. I've got some chicken thigh. This is boneless and skinless. I wouldn't personally recommend getting boneless and skinless um, in general. But if you're someone that just wants to like you know cook chicken really quick and something that's sort of fail proof, just the boneless skinless chicken thigh. You marinate it. You grill it. It's delicious. I just find that when you have the bone and the skin, you actually have more options. I'm also going to be showing later on, I'm sure, how to break down a chicken and stuff. Um, rice, a bajillion types of rice. I'm gonna be cooking with some jasmine rice. And actually, to get things started, because we gotta get some cooking started, there's a fly in here. How you doing? You need some help? Let me get you out. I got you. So I don't know why, but the first couple years when we were doing Brothers Green, we didn't ever wash our rice, and people would complain about it. And I didn't fully understand the nature of the importance of washing rice until actually kind of years later. So what I like to do, I've actually been cooking rice in the Instant Pot, and um, if you have a rice cooker, that's great. If you have a stove, that's great too. The Instant Pot has been kind of blowing my mind. All I do is I just wash the rice out. And it's not like sushi rice where you're washing it like 50 times or whatever. Um, you just give it a little wash and you'll see that it gets kind of milky. And it kind of like massages around a little bit. Basically, you're just kind of taking off some of the excess starches. It's just gonna help when it cooks. Uh, it won't stick together quite so much. And then I just kind of let that all say goodbye. You can save that starch water for something, I'm sure. Um, you know, that's again, part of this series is exploring like little things like that. Like I have rice, which means I have rice flour. I can blend this up to make rice flour and I can also get rice starch out of it. So rice is such a versatile ingredient for that way. I can also make, you know, different pancakes and breads out of rice. And of course, you could use wheat. I'm using rice. I have a wife who is allergic to wheat. So I try to focus on more rice cooking. And I'm just gonna fill this up a little bit. I tend to eyeball it. Sometimes I get it right, um, usually with rice, especially in like an Instant Pot one-to-one. -one. Um, I'm just gonna have it barely covering. Throw it in this guy over here. I found that the perfect ratio in the Instant Pot for rice, six minutes, pressure cook, but low pressure cook, and it just comes out incredible. And then you can have like the warming option, so once it's done cooking, it kind of warms. So I wanna get this chicken marinated, and what I thought would be cool is um, there's this really amazing and simple Vietnamese preparation where you basically just take fish sauce and sugar, just the two of those, mix them together. You can add garlic if you want, and then you just marinate chicken thigh, and then they grill it. And it's like whenever you get, 
you know, pork or chicken or something in Vietnamese cuisine when it's grilled, oftentimes, not whenever, but oftentimes it's that marinade. And I used to try it and be like, what is going on? This makes no sense, but it's just the sugar and the umami of the fish sauce. Now, fish sauce is not one of my ingredients, but what is, is chickpeas. I think I have chickpeas down here, yes. God. So chickpeas are also garbanzo beans. Um, again, you can, of course you get a lot of protein, but you can blend them up and make flours. We make a lot of um, gluten-free pizza doughs with chickpeas and like pancakes. The stuff my wife does with this, it's just, however, something that I did recently, and by recently I mean about like six or seven months ago, was start to make miso paste. So miso paste, I'm sure you've seen, it's used in a lot of Korean cuisine, um, Japanese cuisine. Is it Korean? Well, Koreans more, yeah, they use, they use different types of miso. Japanese is a huge advocate, of course, for miso. Um, so I actually thought it'd be interesting to try to make chickpea miso. What a lot of people don't know about miso paste is that you can actually make miso from all different types of beans. And all you need is koji, which koji is these spores that they inoculate on rice, and you can buy it at like a Japanese store. And of course, this is maybe a little more advanced, but I just did want to show you this. This is like a fun project I'm working on, and I'm making chickpea miso right now. So it's, it's basically like a simple process, just takes a long time. It takes like six months to a year. This has been going for six months already and still has a ways to go. But you're basically cooking the chickpeas, mashing them up, mixing them with the koji, and then letting it sit in a jar like this, weighted down for a while. But the reason I wanted to show you this, not because I have the miso yet, but because this is the byproduct of making miso. And to be honest, this is the main reason that I made this. Um, I wanted to try to make a soy sauce that was not just gluten free, but also not made from soy. So this is like basically chickpea soy sauce and it is insane. <laughs> wow, it's so strong. It's, I, I, it's hard to describe how incredible this stuff is. Um, so the byproduct of making miso is tamari. Tamari is basically a gluten free soy sauce. Um, every so often you get this liquid forming on the top of this as it ferments and you pour it off and I've been saving it. So I thought it'd be cool to marinate some chicken in this gold here, oil. So as I mentioned before, um, salt, pepper, oil, like sugar, basic stuff I'm not including in my 10. But again, it's really not about, these are my 10 and I'm gonna be challenging myself for a year to only use this. It's just to help you get thinking because you might have different ingredients. And if I can just give you some ideas to try something new, to get excited about cooking, about trying something different, well, that's freaking awesome to me. Okay. Boom, shakaloom. Boom, boom. Typically what I would do is I would let this sugar dissolve in the soy sauce first and mix it together, but again, I don't care because I'm just having fun. I'm trying new things. Okay, so that's marinated. Showed you guys this stuff. Got our soy sauce here. Now let's go out to the garden and check out one of my favorite ingredients in the world. Welcome to my yard. If you haven't seen it before, it's become my pride and joy recently. Uh, so this is part of the garden. This is where I'm growing a lot of vegetables. I'm not going to give you a whole tour now. There's some other videos um, I've done much more detailed and I will continue to do. But I wanted to show you something that I absolutely am obsessed with right now, which is kale. So I'm planting kale over my yard. And what's cool about kale is it actually turns into these giant trees. So it will grow up and up and up and up and the leaves will go off the side. So you get a ton of kale. And you can start picking it basically any pieces that are, you know, about the size of your hand. You can just kind of pick them off. You can use a, you know, you can cut them, but I just kind of rip them with my hand a little bit. And it's not going to kill the plant. As long as you don't pick too much, it's actually going to encourage more growth, which is pretty cool about growing. Some over here. Different types of kale. I got like a Tuscan kale over here. Back to the cooking mobile. Kale hath arrived. Now here's the thing about kale. First off, it's growing outside, so you can absolutely wash it. Um, although, as farmers know, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with growing food, you probably end up eating a lot of dirt. And that's the thing I would be scared of. It's always good to wash your food. I mean, I'm growing this stuff organic. Um, the main reason to wash food, I would say, is actually not for the dirt and the bugs, but for the pesticides that are sprayed on things like kale. Um, in my case, I'm not putting any pesticides on them, so I can just eat straight up, but you know, it always helps to wash it a little bit. That being said, I like to do garden tours and walk around and just rip stuff off, not a problem. Now, there is something in the garden I wanna show you. So for as much as this series is about picking my 10 ingredients, it's also just as much about using what I have around. And check this out. Mulberries. Mulberries are amazing. I have a gigantic tree right in the back of my house. 
Say hello to my gigantic mulberry tree. This thing is huge. I actually put a tarp under here because I can shake the tree. And also just throughout the day, the mulberries just fall on the ground and then I come over here and I harvest them. But, I mean, I already harvested most of the good ones today. There's so many, I mean, I can't even get to the top. I save them for the birds so they don't eat mine down here. Mm. And I just get huge rations every day. Kind of tastes like a mix between a blueberry and a blackberry, but also like uh, jelly beans. If you do want to get into growing, I'm going to be doing a lot more growing videos on here. I've become obsessed with growing and that's a huge inspiration for this series. Understanding how food grows helps you not only cook better, but appreciate the eating experience better because Simplicity when you're having good ingredients is so much more simple. So kale, for example, kale is amazing. And the bigger it gets, the more heartier it gets, the more fibrous it can get. When you have kale, like you can have kale seedlings, you can eat, you know, micro kale. So what I like to do with kale is, I just rip it off the stem. The stems are, the, you know, you can juice the stems. I just compost stuff. Um, and I used to be intimidated by composting. And what I've come to really appreciate about composting is that you're essentially, by composting, what you're doing is you're not wasting anything. So even if food goes to waste in the fridge, if something goes bad in the fridge, or you're not gonna eat it, it gets like, let's say you have like a pack of cherries and you don't finish them all and a couple of them start to kind of get all like broken down and weird, you compost them and now all of a sudden you're reusing them instead of wasting them, which is just kind of a cool concept. So I'm gonna rip this kale up. What I like to do with kale is keep it really simple. I usually do different types of dressings, like uh, you know, oil, vinegar, whatever. But what I thought would be kind of cool is to actually take some of these mulberries, right, like so, and make them into a dressing. So I'm gonna squeeze them. Mulberry dressing. <laughs> Think about, it. actually I went to the market the other day and I was honestly a little bit thrown off. It's a market that I love to go to and they have great produce and all that stuff. And it, I'm not talking about a farmer's market, but more of like a supermarket style. And I was there and I got kind of thrown off because I've been doing so much growing recently. The idea of being in a market and deciding what I want to eat from this plethora of thousands and thousands of ingredients was actually kind of weird and discombobulating. And it's kind of like how it was for me when I first started cooking. Going to a restaurant became really weird. The idea of like looking at a menu and choosing what I wanted off of a menu. For me, you know, I like to look in my fridge and see what's fresh and cook something that's inspired. But choosing a menu, it's like this, becomes like almost like a foreign thing, as weird as that sounds. And your hands, well, my hands will be purple, so just accept, accept the purple, folks. We're painting here, painting with food. Now I'm gonna take some, I've got avocado oil. And you know, one of my ingredients was apples, and hey, Rice, you're done. Yay. Okay, I'm gonna let you cook just for a little bit more. We'll keep warm in there. So one of my ingredients as, uh, you know, my sort of sweet thing was an apple um, for one of the 10. And what's cool about apples is they make apple cider vinegar. And I have some here, I did not make this, but I'm going to be exploring making it this year. I have some apples growing. I'm obsessed with apples. I'm gonna put a little apple cider vinegar in here. Just a little splash. A splash of a splash of it. A little pepper, some salt, oil. I hit this point in cooking where I felt like I had to get more and more advanced, you know, get more and more techniques and ideas and, and seek out other cultures and cuisines and recipes. And it's like, there's a whole world out there where that's a thing and I appreciate that and love that. But I'm telling you, the more I grow my own food, the more I just want to make things that are so incredibly simple. Wow. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. Okay, so with kale, um, I think the reason people don't like kale is because they haven't had it <laughs> done right. And this is probably way too much dressing, which is okay. You know what I'll do? Because... I'm happy to have that dressing for something else. I'm gonna just take whatever the dressing gets picked up, put it in here, yeah. And then just mix this together. And the biggest thing about kale is because it is a little more fibrous, especially when you get it in the market, um, this, my kale is a little bit more tender because it's right off of the teeth. 
The deed of life, you just want to massage it. When you massage kale, I think it becomes one of the absolute best, and I mean absolute best things that there is in the human existence of eating. I love kale too, you can saute it, you can make chips out of it, you can dehydrate kale. Like I could take this and dehydrate it and make just like these amazing crispy chips out of it. Um, what's fun is if you're making a kale salad, make a big batch, maybe I'll do it right now. Screw it, I'm gonna do it. Screw it, I'm gonna do it. Screw it, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I always gotta sing in the kitchen. So if you're making a big batch of kale and you have a dehydrator or you have an oven that you can put on extremely low temperatures and, and leave the oven door slightly open, you can dehydrate kale. And you make kale chips. And you can go to the store and buy kale chips for way too much money and be ripped off or you can make it for crazy, crazy nothing. This dish right now, considering I'm growing my kale and the mulberries, um, probably cost 15 cents or something. The amount of apple cider vinegar and oil, and you know, which is pretty cool. So I'm just gonna take some of this. I've got my little kale salad here, which is, oh my God. I'm telling you. You know, for me, cooking is really just an opportunity to share the love. You know, it's an opportunity to inspire people to do something different and try something new, have fun. Um, kind of going back to the simplicity, because I really believe there's enough food in the world to feed everybody. I do a lot of events for um, the local food rescue, Joy's Kitchen, and they basically go to all these local markets and they rescue, essentially, all the food that would be thrown out. And it's not bad food, it's just that markets in America, we have this perception that we always have to have things filled. Go to a bakery, it's gotta be filled. But when you go to France, by two, three o'clock, you walk into a bakery, there's like one or two things left. In America, because we need to see everything so filled, we end up wasting so much food. Uh, excuse me, I have a lot of seasonal allergies. Interestingly enough though, apple cider vinegar is amazing. If you just put a little splash in your water and drink it, it does really help the allergies. At least that's what they tell me and I do it. And it's strong at first, you're gonna be like, you're gonna be like, God damn! But over time, you get used to it, and you can add like bubbly water, and you can add other things to it, and it actually tastes great. I feel like for this, this cabbage, debating if I wanna like steam these, you know? I could grill them up, and I could steam these and kinda of have these like nice little wraps. I mean, that's so cool, right? Man, I wish you guys could talk to me right now and tell me what to do. Tell me what to do, sir. I do have an idea, though. So I'm gonna take this leftover dressing, Add some of the miso sauce, if you will. Maybe this will become my sauce. I could almost even take this stuff and like cook that down. Yeah, I'm gonna see, but. Mm, that on top of that, imagine. This with some rice, some chicken, a little bit of that salad. That's really cool. So another cool thing about cabbage is that you can make sauerkraut. And I actually have this big crock right here. I'm making sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is the easiest way, if you're getting into fermentation, the easiest thing to start with. You're basically just taking a bunch of shredded cabbage, adding salt to it, mixing it together until it starts to break down, putting it in a vessel, and then just letting it sit. It's that simple. And you know, like you can go watch more videos. I'm not here to get, uh, excuse me. I'm not here to get sciencey. I'm not here to get like super technical and tell you you're supposed to do this and that and it's gotta be this and person, whatever. Um, I'm just here to give you ideas. Oh, wow. Rice facial, good lord. Ah, burning rice hot? Oh yeah, it's great. I eat a lot of rice. And rice is great. Not only is it versatile, but you can just make white rice and then, of course, I make a lot of stir fries because as it sits in the fridge, it gets better. And fried rice. Wow, see how good this cook? It was so fast. Got this chicken. I think we go outside and grill it. What do you guys think? I hear you. I hear you. Damn it. Spilled my apple cider vinegar everywhere. Good thing though, apple cider vinegar actually makes a great cleaner. <laughs> this is my plan. But if you um, don't want to buy like that weird chemical cleaners and stuff, take some water, apple cider vinegar, and some baking soda. Put that together, 
and it makes a great cleaner. Ironically, it's also the thing that's saving my tomato plants right now because there's some sort of bug that's been just sucking away my tomato plant leaves. So I made that, basically that same mixture. I spray it on the leaves, it doesn't harm the tree, but it keeps the bugs off. All right, grill is hot. So I don't know if you can see in here, but I actually, see that? I put in some uh, wood just to kind of smoke it. Not like wood chips, like the traditional way people do it in a barbecue. I just put in some like small logs of wood. And that actually just helps bring out some really smoky flavors. Woohoo! Now, an important trick that I've found with grilling is to not start fussing with the chicken until it has a nice sear on the bottom. And if anything, just turn the heat down if you feel like it's gonna be burning too much. Because once it gets a nice sear, it should naturally flip. Now this chicken has a lot of sugar in it, so that will affect a little bit of the stickage because it's gonna get extra crispy and caramelized. And it might even look more burnt than it normally would, but that is perfectly okay. Just for fun, I'm gonna see what happens if I put these on top, kind of smoke them a little bit. So some of you might know, I was just in the jungle in Peru. I just spent three weeks in Peru, in Cusco, and to the Andes and the mountains in the jungle. I was doing some sacred medicines, as they call them, plant medicines. I did some ayahuasca, um, some wachuma, which is also San Pedro. And I had a lot of amazing messages. Um, I definitely have a really cool sort of documented journey I'm gonna be sharing on this channel. If you're interested in ayahuasca, um, it's something I've been fascinating with for the last 10 years and actually I've never done it until now. Um, and it really blew my mind, as it blows most people's minds. But a huge message that I got, honestly, not even because of the medicine so much, just being in the jungle. Um, we spent almost a week in the jungle, uh, completely without electricity, without connection, without you know internet, anything like that. And I felt so present, I felt so alive. I noticed that when I had my phone and my computer and I'm always on it, I end up getting bored. Do you have this experience where it's like, you're doing something, you're working, but then you're checking Facebook and then you're looking at your phone. It's like, there's this boredom that comes having sometimes too much technology. And it was just a reminder to me, like I was sitting in the jungle and I could, I could look at a tree for four hours and be totally present. And that's why I love growing food. And that's why I have so much food around my yard because I feel so connected to the plants. There's something so, incredibly beautiful about being you know connected to what you're growing and then learning how to cook things simply and that's a huge inspiration for this video and like this whole series oh my god is that yeah it's almost on it's almost off the stickage um but that is just something that i want to share with you guys because if you feel like you're maybe living in a city or you're not surrounded by green enough and you feel like you're missing something in your life just try getting outside in nature just try sitting in nature and seeing how that feels because too much electricity and technology can kind of throw us off and I'm not against it like I love getting to create this show I love getting to share it with y'all I love getting to you know meet people and connect people from around the world it's such a cool thing but sometimes like I just start to feel so disconnected this whole idea of so much connection can be very disconnecting um, and for me just being in nature and working with plants like I get them you know and, and what used to be intimidating growing so much food is not just simple I walk around every day I look at every single tree I have, you know, said a hundred things plus growing. I look at every single tree, see how it's doing, see what it needs, and we just have a good time. Wow! Yeah, it's gonna stick a little bit, it's okay. I didn't really, you know, grease up my grill. I probably should have done that. But look how good that looks. Oh yeah, that one didn't stick at all. What do you know? What do you know? Oh, that piece is mine right now. Ah. Ah. Wow. All right, some advancements. The cabbage has been sort of lightly wilted and smoked. It'd be a great wrap. The chicken looks amazing. Hot. Got a little kale salad here. Fresh rice, may even do some mulberries. However, made a mistake. It's gonna be not fun to clean out, but basically, I went outside to grill and I forgot I had taken the marinade from the chicken and the rest of the sauce and put it on the pan. I thought I put it on low enough, but it was a little too high and it turned out to burn and turned into this. So this is, as Bob Ross says, there are no mistakes, just happy accidents. This 
is like an apple cider mulberry miso candy. And it has a little bit of a burnt taste to it, but it also tastes really freaking good. Wow. I'm a true believer that most of the greatest inventions in life came from mistakes, and people are so afraid to make mistakes. They're so afraid to, you know, embarrass themselves, mess up, and, and screw things up. But the truth is, that's just a story, because most of the great things come when you make a mistake. And I, I relate everything back to music. If I'm playing guitar, I'm so used to playing guitar a certain way. You know, every time I say the guitar, I'm gonna probably play the same chords. Oftentimes, it's not until I hit the wrong note by accident that I'm like, oh, interesting, that's cool. Because what's happening is I'm breaking myself out of a box I don't realize by making a mistake. So yeah, mistakes are not real. Just happy accidents. Shout out to Bob Ross. If you don't know Bob Ross, he is the awesome, fro, loving, well he was, he passed away. Um, a very young age, um, painter. He used to be on PBS, and he would just paint. He was super cool, super chill, and he always said that there were no accidents, just, you know, no mistakes, happy accidents, that's right. Oh my god, it's chicken. I can't. I can't. I can't! I can, but I can't. But I can't, because I will. But I can't, but I can't. Mm. This is simplicity at its finest. And I'm hoping that seeing things like this inspires you to look around and see what you have. See what you have in the fridge, but also see what you have access to. See what's affordable right now. Okay, so I'm gonna do some rice on the bottom. I'm feeling like I wish I had a sauce, but sometimes you don't need sauce. Sometimes you just need happy accidents, all this stuff. Oh wait, I don't need a sauce because I got my salad. Heck yeah, look at that. Wow. Add a little salad on top. And this all came just from kind of seeing what I had around, what's growing, what's fresh, what I like. And I made something really simple. And I'm gonna add some of this crispy stuff. Went on a couple, couple of them mold beddies. Oh, and I have one more thing. Technically these could go a little bit longer. But, that's already pretty good. Little cow chips. That kind of, I don't know. Right there, I don't know. Let's see if I know how to plate stuff. Wow. There we have it. Goodbye. No, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna eat it, don't worry. People don't like, and you don't, I don't know why. It's like they wanna see me eat it. It's like, but you could be cooking right now and making it, eating it yourself. trying to make sense of this. Never had anything like this before. I could even just kind of like wrap it up like a burrito. Hey, these are like great burrito wraps. What do you know? A little soy. The only thing it's missing is a little, little pinch of some sort of umami salt. Just a little bit. You know, it's funny, I make these products and I forget to use them because I'm, I cherish them so much. I'm like, but I made this in six months that I don't use it. I'm like, I just need to start using stuff. Mm. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all in the hips. It's all in the hips. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Of course, if you want to subscribe to the channel, that would be awesome. And what's cool is even just cooking this video, I'm starting to see what this series could be and how much it could inspire you. And if you have ideas, send them my way. Um, there's gonna be a lot more content to come. And I'm feeling good. It's nice to be back. I feel like I've been gone for too long. Love you. Peace.